Okay, thanks everyone for joining. So we're gonna be talking about securing access to remote systems with WireGuard and Linux. Um, yeah, so about me, um, my name is Alex. I'm a digital nomad. I travel around a lot. I haven't really had a hometown for the past year. I've been in like Colombia, India, um, Mexico driving around the states a lot, um, but I'm from the states, originally upstate New York. Um, I used to do DevOps at IBM. Uh, I did a lot of stuff for Red Hat with OpenShift, and then I started NetMaker a few years ago, and we work with WireGuard a lot, and that's what we're gonna be talking about. So just a little bit about NetMaker, throw it out there, and you'll find out a little bit more about it at the end, but you know, it's kind of a config manager for WireGuard coordination server. You can kind of think of how Kubernetes works with nodes, NetMaker works with WireGuard, and you'll probably see how it can be handy by the end of this if you're going through the tutorial, but we're gonna stick to WireGuard for the most of it. Um, so the point of it and why we're doing this tutorial is kind of for some more basic day-to-day -day activities that we see from a lot of our users, which is just setting up remote access to systems, uh, trying to do some simple secure access to different things. So I know a lot of talks here are much higher level, more about zero trust, modern application security, EBPF, um, but we're kind of looking more at a day-to-day -day thing, which is like, hey, I've got this remote system. I'm looking to set up some secure access to it. Uh, I want to use WireGuard to do it. So how do I get that done? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about WireGuard a little bit, um, what it is, how it works. We're going to set up a WireGuard server. We're going to use that server to forward traffic into a local environment. We're going to set up access from our workstations. We're going to set up direct, direct access between some servers. Uh, we'll show how to do this with routers, and we'll discuss some limitations with WireGuard and how some tools like NetMaker could help with that. So that's pretty much it. So let's start with WireGuard. What is it? Why are we using it? Uh, so it's a relatively new VPN protocol. Uh, it's Linux native now. It's in the kernel. It's also supported on most other major operating systems. It's supported on a lot of different routers. And it's extremely fast, so you can get very close to the speed of an unencrypted network when you're using WireGuard, which is pretty awesome. It's extremely configurable, so you can build all different types of networks with it, uh, lots of different designs. It's very secure, it uses very modern encryption uh, with asymmetric keys, which means you get a really good level of trust with it as well. It makes it a little bit more challenging to configure at scale, which we'll kind of demonstrate in the tutorial, but um, it also gives you a lot more trust. Uh, so yeah, you can build, use it to build all sorts of networks, so peer-to-peer, -peer, so any two devices or n number of devices directly to each other. You can do it to build site-to-site -site networks, so connecting local networks. Uh, and also to do remote access. So if you've got a VPC or an office network, um, a LAN, you can use WireGuard to get access into that network. And that's what we see most people looking to do in day-to-day -day stuff is just they've got a local environment, they want access to it, or they've got remote devices, stuff at the edge, and they're just like, I wanna use WireGuard to get access to this, so how do I do that? Uh, so that's what we're gonna do. So, uh, setting up WireGuard depends a lot on the target device and the method for setting it up that you wanna do. So, pretty common is using the command line. Uh, so, it's kind of a new network interface when you run it on Linux, but then there's this helper script called wgquick that most people are using day to day. Uh, so that's what we're going to be using for this tutorial is WG Quick. It's just kind of a little helper script for setting up the interface. Um, if you're running on Windows, you'll see the GUI interface, which comes with that, which is pretty common. And then if you're running it on routers, there's a lot of different router plugins that you could be using to get set up. So it really depends a lot on the distro. 
Um, but yeah, in this tutorial, we're going to be talking mostly about WG Quick, just because that's the simplest way of doing it. Um, and maybe I'll just show that real quick. So if you just look at that, it's really just a script that comes when you install WireGuard tools. Uh, it does stuff like set up the interface, it'll set up DNS for you using like ResolveConf, it'll set priorities on interfaces. Um, so just lots of standard networking stuff kind of condensed into a little script. Um, but let's, I'll just skip to this one actually. So, you know, if you're doing it by hand, you know, you, you install WireGuard, you'll add a new uh, link of type WireGuard and you'll add an address to it. You'll add peers to it manually. Um, so that's on the left side here. And then if you're using WG Quick with a configuration file, you're just gonna, you know, set the configuration file and set it up and it's just gonna do all that other stuff for you pretty quickly, which is pretty nice. Um, so going back to that config file, this is what we're gonna be working with mostly. So there's really two sections, it's the interface and the peer. So the interface is really the device you're working with um, and you're giving it an address, that'll be its address for the VPN. Uh, you're giving it a private key and you're going to set a listen port, which is the port that the interface is listening on. Um, some other settings like MTU, uh, DNS for, um, you know, if you're setting a private DNS server or something like that. And then these helpful things are post up and post down, which is really just any arbitrary commands you want to run when the interface goes up or down, which is really nice. Um, so if you're doing stuff like forwarding into a local network, uh, that's typically where you're going to do that. And then the peer section is where you're going to put other devices that are going to be connecting to this, uh, this peer. So uh, in this, we've only got one, but you would add any number of peers that are going to be connecting into this. And for that, you're going to need their public key. So actually, any peers that are talking to each other, you've got to exchange public keys so that they can talk with each other. Uh, you need to know their allowed IPs, which are the addresses you can communicate with them over. Uh, the endpoint, which is going to be that kind of typically public address and port that that device is reachable over. And then persistent keep alive is just like a little helpful thing that sends a packet every X number of seconds uh, to kind of keep the connection alive so it doesn't go stale, which is typically a good thing to set on there. Um, yeah, so that's the basics of it. I guess any questions before I keep going with this? Yes. Yeah, uh, what is the key encryption format? I should know off the top of my head, but I don't. Uh, <laughs> that should be that should be one popping into my head. Um, yeah, so I will tell you when you generate them, um, there's a WireGuard command for generating the keys. So let me just skip forward to that. So you have like this WG gen key. Uh, format. It, it, they are base 64 encoded, which doesn't help too much, but yeah, I'll, I'll look that up while we keep going. So that's a pretty standard one that tends to be more stable. Um, it, so I will say on like gigabit networks uh, where you can use jumbo frames, you might want to set it to like 4,000 or something. Uh, so it really depends on where your devices are. So 1420 is just a nice number that tends to work uh, across the internet. Um, but then depending on your environment, you're going to want to adjust that and you'll, you'll see a speed difference. Um, so yeah, really just depends on your, on your network. Mm -hmm. So you, your packet will be divided by two or three or one. So this is safe uh, for you. Yeah, yeah, it tends to be a pretty good value. Um, so, you know, if you go lower, it's going to get slower. Um, so that's kind of like a 
a higher value that tends to work on on most networks. Yeah, yeah, so I think 1280 is also a pretty standard number to use there. Yeah. So in general, play around with it depending on your network. Um, it'll be a little tough to optimize. Um, yeah. We'll keep going with that. Unless there are other questions before I keep going. Uh, okay. So we talked about the command line setup, uh, GUI setup. You know, this is typically going to be on Windows. Uh, you're just going to upload a config file to there and run it. Um, and then the router, again, it's going to depend on what router you're running. Um, but there's some typical steps you do, which you're going to create an interface using whatever the plugin gives you to set up the interface. And you're going to add peers using whatever it gives you to add peers. And then you're typically also going to add routing and NAT rules for the, for the site you're accessing or if you're accessing from the site, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail later on. Uh, yeah, so this gets to the tutorial part. So in this tutorial environment, we've got a bunch of Linux servers running right now, actually. So um, this times however many. Uh, and we've just got a private DNS server. We've got a private web server, a private file server. And so we're treating this like a little uh, mini office environment, you could say. Uh, it's running in a VPC. But all we want to do is remotely access the web server and the file server using the private DNS name. Um, and we want to use our Linux server to do that, treating it as a WireGuard gateway. So that is the goal, and that's what we're going to be setting up. Um, yeah, and then we also have this router in here. Uh, so later on, I'm going to just show you how we set that up separately. We're kind of doing two different things. It's how you would do it via the router and how you would do it via just a device that's running in the local network. It's kind of two different ways of setting up that access. Um, but for the tutorial hands-on part, we'll do it via Linux server. So for that, that's why I passed out these little pieces of paper. Um, so if you go ahead and SSH to your server, you'll be able to start going through these steps. Um, you should have gotten an email if you registered. If not, uh, you can go to uh, this GitHub repo. Um, so it's WG Access Tutorial OSS Europe 2024. So pretty, pretty long there. Um, but it gives you kind of the full instructions for setting this up uh, on your server. So I'll give you guys some time to access that. And then while I'm doing that, would anyone else like a login so they can follow along and try setting this up for them yourself? 
just go ahead and raise your hand if you want that, or there's pieces of paper there for those logins. Um, so what we're going to be doing is setting up the server. We're going to be making it so it can forward to the local network. Uh, and then we're going to be setting up the access from our local workstations so we can get there. And that's pretty much it. Okay. So for those of you who are following along, I'm going to let you get some time to log in. And if anyone has questions while you're doing that, please raise your hand if anything's not working. And I'm just going to go ahead and go through these steps from my workstation. So for those of you who are not running this, um, you can see what that's like. So I'm going to SSH to my server. So again, this is a server running in that VPC environment. So it has access to the local network. Did I get the password right? Nope. Okay, there we go. So first thing I'm gonna do is install WireGuard tools. So that's just some helpful stuff for when you're setting up your uh, WireGuard interface, primarily um, WG Quick, which is very nice to have. Um, so once I've done that, I'm gonna check on my interfaces because I'm going to be forwarding. So in this scenario, I'm forwarding to uh, this 10.101 network. That's going to be the, what we're saying is the LAN here. So we're going to set that up. And to start, we're going to go to our WireGuard folder. And then we're going to generate a key pair. So that's going to give us both a private key and a public key. And then we're going to need the private key for setting up our interface. So I'm just gonna go ahead and copy that. And then we're going to create a config file. So actually I'm just gonna go ahead and paste that at the top. That'll be a little easier. And then so we're setting up those sections like we mentioned there. Um, so the private key is going to be the private encryption key of this server. And then I'm going to give it its private address. This could be anything, but for something we're going to do later, I'm just going to go ahead and use my server number as the uh, last digit there. So this is going to be my server's private address. And then the listen port, it will be 51820 by default. Uh, so again, this is where you're going to be connecting to this device over. Um, and then we've got a series of post up and post down commands here. Uh, and we gave two options there, one using IP tables, one using NF tables. I'm just gonna go ahead and use the IP tables commands there. So we're setting up IP forwarding um, and then after that, we're going to be adding some NAT rules uh, so that we can forward Oh, did I skip something there? I deleted something. Excuse me, dash O. So this is what's going to let us forward to over that local interface into the local network. And then this last one is post down, which runs when the interface is brought down. And it's just going to stop that 
forwarding from happening. Okay. And that's it for that part. And I'm going to go ahead and create that interface. So we should see it now when we use our WG command. You can see it there. Um, you should be able to see it in your interfaces. There it is. Okay. So we now have a WireGuard interface, which should be accessible in forwarding traffic. Hey. Oh, is it? Oh, let's see there. Uh oh. Mm. All right, let's see if that stays any more stable. Yeah, is the visibility okay? Uh, or the text size? Okay. Um, so, for those of you who are following along, just uh, want to check where you're at with that. Um, I don't want to run too far ahead of people. I guess if anyone has questions in the meantime, go ahead and ask them. You can raise your hand or if you have anything you want to bring up. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you should. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, do you need some more time on that? Okay. So the next step is going to be to add a peer, which will be your local device. Um, and let's say you're setting up access to a few, for a few people, um, it's going to be the same process for adding multiple devices, uh, but we're just going to do one here. So I'll write in at CWireGuard. So I'm just making a folder to put those keys in. And I will say, so typically what you want to do is generate the key pair on the device that's going to use it. And you would only share the public key. Um, here I'm doing it on the server just for convenience sake. But um, yeah, so typically, and I could do this actually, I could just go over to my local and run the same command and then share that key. Um, I could share this with the server and use this. So that would probably be a safer method of doing that. Um, and I could still do that actually, but I'm not. So then we're going to go ahead and modify that file to include a peer section. So for that, you're just going to add a section that says peer and you're going to have its public key. And you want the allowed IPs in there. So this is going to be the private address of that peer. So in order to establish communications, um, one of the two is going to need to have an endpoint. And we'll set that up on the other, on the local device. But here we're just going to leave the endpoint blank, which means uh, when this peer reaches out, it's going to kind of know what the endpoint is and it's going to allow the communications to establish. So this peer is going to reach out to the server and then the server is going to know its endpoint. 
And, but that's pretty much it. So you just need a public key and then allowed IP. And let's go ahead and restart that interface. So we can now see that there. Now you're gonna see a handshake when that actual communication starts, since there's no WireGuard running locally, there's not going to be handshake yet, but we can recheck that in a minute. Um, so I'm gonna go over to my local device and I am going to set up the connection here. So I already have WireGuard installed locally. Um, for those of you following along, you will need to install WireGuard. Um, but it's going to be the same process, just kind of in reverse. We're going to create a config file. We're going to create the interface and the peer, but this time the interface will be for the local device. The peer will be for the server. Then we're going to start that interface and we should st start being able to access stuff. Um, and actually there is a small typo in there. Uh, those files are case sensitive and this should be uppercase. Okay. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy that contents. And actually, I think I already made a file previously, but this was a different setup. So we'll do it this way. Uh, so the private key. Again, should have been done on that device, but I did it over here. Oh, did I generate it on the wrong thing? Hmm, uh-oh. I might have overwritten the private public key pair, which would not be good. Um, okay, well, what I can do, let's make sure that, let's see which public key I have here now. And this is probably the most annoying part of dealing with multiple peers is trying to figure out which key belongs to which and exchanging them properly. Yeah, so I generated it in the wrong directory, and so now it's for the wrong one. So I'm just going to modify this existing one. Um... So I'm going to say, I'm just gonna take, I'm gonna take this private key. This is gonna be the new server private key. And then I'm gonna generate a new one locally and use that instead. So over here, I think I already did that actually. So I can take this one, throw it over on the server. Okay, then I can restart that interface again. There we go. Okay, so then over here, I need my private key now. So a couple things I'm doing here. So that address is correct. So the DNS, that's pointing to the DNS server we have running in the LAN. So then we bring up this interface. It should, should set our DNS locally um, to use that private DNS server, which would be nice. Uh, And then I'm going to need to add my server public key here for the endpoint. You're going to add the public IP of that. You could also, and let's say the devices are running in the same LAN. There's not as much of a use case for running that traffic over a VPN, but you could use the LAN IP in that case. It's really just 
any reachable IP address of this device. And then for the allowed IPs, we have that VPN address, but then the other thing we're adding is the whole LAN IP address range. Um, so that we know to run or to send traffic destined for the VPC through this peer. And that should be it. So let's see if I set this up correctly. Make sure. Okay, so we can now check. All right, so we've got the local interface up and running and you can see there's a handshake there. So it is actually communicating with the server, which is nice. If we look on the server side, we should see the same. So there's a handshake, there's transfer being sent, the keep alive is running. So there's now communication between the two and we can check, just make sure that the server itself first is reachable over that IP address, which it is. And then we're gonna check to see if we can reach the LAN. So is it forwarding correctly? So, whoop. And it is, so that's our web server and we can check the DNS. Looks like DNS got set up and then I can go to my browser. And cool, so there we go. So now we've got access from the local, uh, from the remote device to that local network using the DNS all set up and nice. Um, yeah, uh, I guess quick check in with the people who are following along. How are you guys doing? Uh, so, so, okay. Oh, nice. You're running on the phone. That's cool. So I was gonna say, um, and actually anyone could do this from their phone if they want. You could install the WireGuard app. And actually what we did is we have a, a pre-configured server with a bunch of peers on it. And this is public. So this is not how you would wanna set it up, but for demonstration purposes, it'll work. Uh, so if you were to install the WireGuard app right now and go to this folder, download one of these config files and run it with WireGuard on your phone, you should be able to access those resources as well. So basically, if I go back to the presentation, so we've got one WireGuard server already set up in there. It's already got all these config files generated. So. Um, you would just become a peer of this server uh, and it'll forward your traffic into the local network. So, oh. This configuration we just set up will forward uh, only the traffic uh, uh, on the private network uh, on my uh, on the VM. Uh, so all my traffic will pass via the VM. So only the traffic uh, uh, in the VM uh, network uh, so what we're doing is a, it's a, a split tunnel VPN. So it's only going to be forwarding traffic for the, for the LAN address ranges. Um, yeah. And the devices inside that network aren't really affected by it. It's just the remote devices that have this configuration set up. It would be very simple to change this into a full tunnel VPN if you wanted to. Um, all you'd have to do is rather than forward over the uh, ETH1 interface, I think you do ETH0 there and in your IP tables rules. And then in your config file, um, yeah, you do forwarding for ETH0. And then in the allowed IPs on your local device, rather than saying, all right, I'm sending traffic for this VPN address and also for this LAN. Instead of that, we would just put uh, all, addresser, all addresses, so we do 0, .0, 0, 0, 0, and you can put IPv6 in there as well. Um, so this is telling it, okay, send all my traffic over this. 
and we wouldn't probably want to use a private DNS server there. We'd want to use something like 8888. Um, but yeah, so then you'd have a full tunnel VPN using whatever server you set up. Sure. Okay. So my question on port zero 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 slash one and then function twenty eight dot zero dot zero dot zero slash one. Oh interesting. Yeah, it's it's just two separate networks and then the metric doesn't uh doesn't take precedence because the networks are more than just the zero 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 slash zero so Okay. Yeah, that's an interesting work right for. Yeah, that's with WG Quick you're using, or are you setting it up manually? Okay, I th think you'd have to just avoid using WG Quick for that. Um, so you'd be setting your, I think you'd just be changing your default gateway in that case locally, um, if that's what you're trying to do. Um, yeah. Yeah, but other than that, I, I don't really. Sh I don't think there's any way to specify metrics in the config file when you're using the script. Um, you could modify the script itself, and it is just a it's just a bash script. So you could go in there and find where it's setting the metric and change it. But yeah, other than that, huh. okay. Uh, other questions or people still stuck getting set up. Mm -hmm. You would add the private key of the local device into the interface of the local device. Yep. So you should have two key pairs, one key pair for your server, one key pair for your local device. Uh, I think there might be a tool if you're using PowerShell, but otherwise I would just generate it on the server and then copy paste the key in uh, is probably the easiest way. Yeah. So again, yeah, the interface of whatever your device you're on should have the private key for that device. And then the peer section should have the public key of the other device. Okay, so yeah, what time are we at? I want to make sure I'm not. What time does this end? <laughs> Anyone know off the top of their head? <laughs> We're at two forty. Think we have until when? Okay. Thirty-five. Okay, we got a while then. Okay, so about halfway through. Um, so this is what I put as the next section. Well, I guess we can give this a try and see how it goes. So we don't have that many people uh, following along. Um, but let's talk about this next section. If you're still setting up, that's fine too. Um, but if you did set up a server, what we can do is kind of demonstrate direct peer-to-peer -peer connections. So um, what we did in this scenario was just route traffic through a server into a local network. But sometimes what you want to do is just have devices communicating directly with each other. Um, so an example would be maybe you've got an app server in the cloud, but you have your database on-prem and you want to just have a secure link between the two. Um, this is also sometimes called like a mesh VPN. So, or point to point. So just, you could do it with just two devices, have just one tunnel between two devices for sending whatever you need to send. 
Um, or you could have it with n number of devices. So set up a network of however many. Um, this is where the config files get very complicated. Uh, so I was going to give this a try and see how we, how we do with it. Um, so the pro, more secure, um, you know, all the traffic is going over uh, encrypted tunnels. You're not forwarding traffic unencrypted. Um, the con is it's more complex. So all the peers have to have configuration for all the other peers. And, you know, you're kind of seeing if you're setting up right now, it's a little bit challenging just setting up one file for one for two peers to exchange their data. So uh, if you're doing peer-to-peer, -peer, you need the public key for every other device in the network. You need to know the reachable IP and port. You need to know its private address. And then if any of those devices, if any of that information changes, if you're rotating your keys, if an IP address changes, then you got to update that on all the other peers in the network. Um, so that's actually something that NetMaker helps with. Um, but yeah, so to try that out, oh, go ahead. Sorry? Sure. Mm -hmm. I think I need you to explain one more time. I'm trying to, are you, are you just asking if it's feasible to just use the same private and public keys for all the devices? Okay. Good question. I don't see why you couldn't. Go ahead. Sorry? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, let's keep going for now. Um, so for those of you guys who did manage to get, actually, I guess raising hands, who was able to set this up? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so uh, what I'd like you to do, if you have access to the tutorial, um, is go to this folder, and I'll just go ahead and... Um, let's see if I should be able to add a filter here. I don't know if it applies to everyone, but add your public key to your server. And then you can try adding a few of your peers to it. So I think we have like six or seven people. Um, it would take a lot of time to set it up for six or seven, but you could add like a couple of them. Uh, so uh, that would be, be building a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, you can just give it a try. Okay, so we got one, two, three. 
and it might be good to split it out a bit. Uh, let's see, create a filter. This filter is a filter for everyone. Nice. Okay. So, anyone still trying to put it in? Otherwise, I'll just go ahead and filter this. Okay. Well, we can try with the three people who are up right now. Okay, so for you three guys who did put it in, um, you could go ahead and add each other as peers to your network. So you, all you have to do is add another peer section in. Uh, you'll need the endpoint, which will be the IP address. You'll need the public key, and you'll need the private address, and that should be it, and you should be able to reach each other directly. Uh, now, to note, it only works if you all do it. <laughs> So if you add someone else as a peer and they don't add you, uh, that's with the asymmetric encryption, uh, they need to, it needs to be an exchange. Um, so if you all add each other there, you'll be, able to, you'll be able to ping each other. If anyone doesn't add them, you won't be able to reach them. And that's meant to be a feature. Um, but yeah, I'll let you guys give that a try. And while that's happening, I might just go ahead to the next section, which kind of gets out of the uh, tutorial part. I'm just going to talk a little bit about routers um, and then also some higher level stuff you can use like NetMaker to do similar stuff. So um, I'm bringing up routers because primarily when we see people doing these use cases, either they want to access a full site and use the router for it, or they want to deploy an endpoint and access via the endpoint. And you have either option, so um, you can treat the router as that endpoint. Um, it is going to depend, again, on your operating system, whatever you're running. But in general, you're going to install the WireGuard plugin and follow those same steps. Uh, so you're going to create a WireGuard interface. Uh, you're going to add peers to it. And then on top of that, you're going to add routing for the local network, um, which would kind of be in place of those post-up forwarding rules that we put on the endpoint. So in our environment, I think I have one set up somewhere. I hope, let's find out. Oh yeah, over here. So here we've got Microtik. Uh, so on this guy, we already set up uh, WireGuard on it. So installed the plugin. Uh, we've got the interface here. So similar thing, it's just, you know, a GUI where you're putting in those settings, you're putting in the private key. Uh, and then, so exactly like that interface section, just in GUI format, and then you add peers to it, similar thing. Uh, we're going to add the public key, we're going to add the endpoint that's reachable over the port, and that's pretty much it. And then on top of that, you're going to add, in our case, for routing to the local network, where was that? I think it's under IP. I get a little confused by this. Uh, maybe it's firewall NAT. Yeah, so over there we've got a um, masquerade rule. Uh, it's going to do something similar to our IP tables rule. So just peers will be able to forward traffic into the local network over the router. Um, so you can do similar stuff there uh, for other des designs. So that's for just accessing the local network over the VPN. You could do something in reverse where all the local devices can access stuff over the VPN without having to have the VPN installed on the local devices. And you could do this with multiple routers and set up site-to-site -site networks. So basically the other peers are the routers and then you have communication over sites uh, using WireGuard. Uh, da -da -da -da. So that's pretty much that on the router setup. Um, then I had a couple notes on setting it up behind routers because it can get a little tricky. So we had an endpoint running on the on a server in that local environment, but it had a public IP, which made it super easy to set up. Um, so in a lot of corporate settings, you might have like a CG NAT or a strict firewall or something like that. So in those situations, it's not going to be so easy to route traffic to that endpoint. Um, so 
what we need at the end of the day, if we go back to our config file, if we've got a remote device and it needs to access that endpoint, it needs something reachable here. Uh, so there's a couple ways you can set this up so that you can have something that's reachable. Um, so one way is to just do port forwarding on the router, which is pretty straightforward. Uh, so you're just gonna say, okay, allow traffic to this local device, and then you're gonna use that um, public interface and whatever port you're forwarding over here, and you'll be able to reach in there. Um, in some other environments, this is a bit more tricky of a setup, but basically um, what you can do is, let's say you don't have access to the router, you just want to deploy an endpoint in that local environment uh, and be able to access it. So what you can do is kind of set up a relay for traffic in, uh, let's say, a cloud environment. So something you can reach outside of that environment. And then when you set up something in the local environment, it's gonna be similar to, to how we set up this. So let's say you have that cloud endpoint on this server here, and then its peer is that endpoint in the local network. So you're just not gonna add that endpoint section here. So you're gonna let the peer behind the firewall or router or whatever reach out to this uh, to this public machine. And then that becomes the relay for traffic for connections. So your clients, uh, the remote devices, they're gonna reach out to this server here, which is reachable. Um, simultaneously, this one, which is forwarding traffic to the LAN is going to reach out to this server. Um, so that's going to establish the connection. Uh, it's going to be able to kind of discover the endpoint that way, even if there's like a double NAT in the way. Um, and then, yeah, when your remote clients reach out, they're going to go to this server first, and then it's going to forward traffic to this server, and then it's going to go to the LAN. Um, so that's another kind of design you can do to work around some more restrictive environments. Uh, da -da -da -da. And sorry, mm -hmm. if the internet connection stops, uh, mm, yeah, so the persistent keep alive will help with that. So you can just have the persistent keep alive running and it'll keep the, the socket open. So that's, that's kind of why it's helpful to have this guy in here. Um, okay, I guess, were you guys able to, to set this up at all, that peer-to-peer -peer stuff? Okay. Well, we'll see how that goes, but yeah, I'll let you guys continue with that if you want. Um, Okay, other than that, so I was going to go next and talk about kind of some of the limitations of WireGuard and then building on top of it to do other stuff. So let's go there. Um, so WireGuard is small and simple by design. That was a design decision not to add on higher level features of what a lot of modern VPNs do. Um, the, it's meant to keep the code base very small. It's meant to do the basics. Um, so you don't get any user identities. You don't have sessions. Um, there's no like service level stuff. Uh, and then as you saw there, there's no like discovery of other endpoints or automation of distributing any of these keys or managing it. So it, if you're building a network that's more than just a few endpoints, when you start to use, when you're trying to set it up manually, you're getting into a lot of work and then if stuff changes, it's even more work. Um, so that's why a lot of people like to add some form of automation or tooling on top of it. Um, and if you use a lot of modern VPNs or some zero trust solutions, they'll use WireGuard under the hood for the encryption. And then, um, 
add on that stuff that a lot of people want out of a VPN. So there's a lot of tools out there that have been built on top of WireGuard that do a lot of stiff stuff. So I just put in a link to there. Uh, so anything from like generating all these config files for you to just helper tools like SOC5 proxies um, and then, you know, mesh networks, which we are one of. Uh, so there's a lot of tools for that. Um, stuff for just managing all your config files. So lots of stuff has been built on top of it. Um, I'm even adding in this uh, slides here at the end, uh, we built out this little access script you could use uh, for doing something similar to what we did, which is you set up one access server and then generate however many config files, and then you can just hand out those config files to people. Um, and that's what a lot of people end up doing is they'll send, set up a single server, they make a script to just generate some files on top of it, and then they'll hand those out to people and that's how they access it. Um, so that's kind of the basics. Um, but then I wanted to talk a little bit about NetMaker and how we would do this um, with our tool, which is pretty straightforward. So I think I've got the environment set up here. Uh, but basically, we have a server which manages all these nodes, which are, you know, the devices running WireGuard in your network. So it's going to manage stuff like passing out the public keys to the devices in the network. It's going to do endpoint discovery. So you're going to know what the IP addresses are of everything else in there. Um, it's going to manage the ports and it's going to manage forwarding into whatever networks you're trying to forward into. So, um, you know, for instance, I think someone mentioned, oh, how would I forward all the traffic? So for that, we've got, we call it an internet gateway. So um, you would specify a device in your network to be an internet gateway and then select which hosts to forward traffic for. And then you've got a full tunnel VPN for all the internet traffic for doing what we did in this tutorial. So I set it up here. So I just have one endpoint deployed like our WireGuard servers. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so the, the difference is not really so much in the gateway itself. Uh, and so we're not using configuration file. Actually, we allow you to use configuration files. But when you do this stuff, it, it's doing like the lower level stuff. We're not using those like the WG quick script. So we're doing like, um, you know, more the, the actual commands that'll set up the interface. Yeah, yeah, the, but I will say, so what we do have here, actually, let me just show you the scenario once more. Um, so we talked about this method of setting it up where you've got like kind of a cloud endpoint and then you've got the local endpoint forwarding. Um, so I kind of set that up here. So we have an endpoint in the local environment. We specified which ranges are you going to forward to? So it's got the LAN there. And then we've got this endpoint running in the cloud, um, which our remote devices are going to attach to. Uh, we set the DNS settings there. And then actually here we can generate config files, which will run locally. And then you can just download these and run them on devices. Um, so, you know, you can see that config file get generated. It's got the DNS settings and whatnot. Um, so that's another way you can pass it out. We also, sorry, someone have a question? No. Um, and then we also have a nifty client here. So you add on kind of that user auth level. So you can integrate it with OAuth, have users line it, log in with their account and they, you set up their access level and what they have access to, and then you're going to just connect, and that's actually gonna do the same thing. Um, and here we are using those configuration files, so it is gonna generate one um, and run it locally. So, um, yeah, just a nicer way to run those sorts of use cases. Uh, in addition to the peer-to-peer -peer stuff, so 
If you add any devices to the network, they're going to exchange their addresses, their keys, and whatnot, and be able to reach each other. So it lets you design pretty much all those different types of networks, so you can set up those site-to-site, -site, remote access, um, you know, direct endpoint connections, all that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, that I think gets to the bulk of it. Just wanted to check in. Do you guys manage to get any of those peer-to-peer -peer setups working? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. Uh, you should just be able to ping the private address of the other server. I did add a little bonus in there. If you want, you can run a um, you can run a web server on there, and then you could curl it to see if you can reach their secret message. Oh, let's see, where did I put that? I've got too many tabs open now. Yeah. So if you want, you can run a Docker container with a secret message and then the other person could curl it and see if it's reachable. Um, yeah, but other than that, you would just ping the private address of whatever peer you created, see if it's reachable. If so, you're good to go. Okay, well, that's pretty much it for the tutorial. I know there's still time here, so I guess if people have any questions now would be a good time. Um, yeah. So if I want to set up a network as Yeah, so you mean if you're doing like an HA setup or? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so for that, I think it's typically just an externalized um, MQTT. Uh, so you can set it up however you want. Um, you could do a cluster or a single node of it. So, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, you can, I think we have integrations with EMQX, I think is the typical one we'd use for, for HA. Oh, the server. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty it's pretty stable just as a single node. So, I mean, the best way to get started is just to deploy on a on a Linux server in any cloud environment, um, and that I think comes with embedded Mosquito Broker, um, and then for HA we have uh, deployment configs for Kubernetes. Um, so, if you're really going to build something resilient, you could do that and then point to probably an EMQX broker, which you could set up as a cluster um, on Kubernetes as well. Yeah. Yep. Do we have a solution for what quant for quantum proofing? Uh, we don't currently have quantum proofing in it, though I know there's like additional keys you can add to WireGuard that does make it quantum safe. Uh, it's not something we've prioritized for the way we set it up, but um, yeah, you can do it with WireGuard. Yeah. 
Yeah, with WireGuard, I believe you can just put in the in the host name for the connection endpoint. Yeah, I, I believe so. Yeah. That should work fine. Yeah, I mean, it's super easy to set up a full tunnel yeah. VPN. I actually did it for some people I met while I was traveling. It was like they couldn't access their bank accounts or should I be talking about us in the session? <laughs> Let's just, it's very easy to set up. Um, you just uh, you just need a server somewhere. It costs a few bucks a month. Um, yeah, there's, there's lots of good options for it. Um, and then from your phone, from your device, you know, it, it's just a simple, um, yeah, it's very simple and it works pretty reliably. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's been a it's been a long week. <laughs> okay. Um, any last questions before we wrap up? Otherwise, we can just send it early. Cool. Uh, and I guess. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, we do. We do have some pro features. So the the setup I showed you, where you do egress into a local environment, generate config files, and do that. That's all. You know, you can do that with just the the open source version. But yeah, we do add some stuff on top of that. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, maybe I could just show you that real quick. So um, maybe I could just do it on the server I have set up. Um, so I'm just going to remove this interface. And then rather than run WireGuard directly on it, I'm going to run NetMaker with WireGuard. So what you do for a network is you add hosts to it. So I want to add a new host to the network. I have an access key there. Um, so first you have to install the what we call the net client. It's really more of an agent. Um, but what this does is just run in the background um, over MQTT and API. It's kind of coordinating with the server to know what all the other um, endpoints are and also sharing this is my endpoint, this is my public key. And then if that information changes, it's gonna send that to the server and that's gonna get distributed to all the other clients. So right now there's nothing running because it hasn't joined the network. And then when I go ahead and run the network, whoops, shouldn't have that be on there. You should see, yeah. So now I can see the other peer information in there, which it got from the server. Um, so if I add any other peers into the network, they're gonna show up. If I was to say, for instance, add a new route here, it'll show up there. Um, and then I can actually, kind of the primary thing you do when you set up these hosts here is you're gonna give them different networking functions. Um, so you can set them up as a gateway for remote clients. So kind of like how we were accessing the environment, you can generate config files and give them the people to access the network. Um, you can set devices as relays if there's like hard to reach places behind like CJ, CGNAT and stuff like that. Um, you can set devices as egress into local environments like we said before, and then also do the full tunnel stuff. So if you just wanna create a standard internet VPN, um, 
Yeah, so that's it. You just kind of add your host to the network, they exchange the information, that creates a peer-to-peer -peer network, and then you're going to set networking functions on top of that for what the different uh, devices in your network are going to be doing, because typically they're going to be doing something like giving access to users or giving access to a local environment, something like that. Yeah, that that can be tough. Um, so it by default is communicating over MQTT, and then it has a fallback mechanism to send and receive its uh, send and receive configuration data over API. Um, so yeah, one of those does need to be accessible, which can be, can be tough. So yeah, in those environments, typically you have to whitelist the, the server's IP address. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So that's kind of the point of this feature is, so there's also like devices that our client doesn't run on. Like there's a million different router operating systems. So rather than deploy that client, it uses this. So this becomes like a hub and spoke network, but any configuration file you add here, you can reach and also can reach anything else in the network. So you could just generate these and run them on any device. So as long as the gateway is reachable, um, this, this device will be reachable from the network and will be able to reach the network. And yeah, they're static, so they don't have to have the MQTT or API communication or anything. And what shows like four and what might like, um, set up like, so people can log in here, Yeah, yeah. So I will, I will say that is a pro feature. The some of the the more advanced user stuff, but um, yeah, you can still add users and have them log in and generate their own files. So you can do that in the basic stuff. Yeah, you get a QR code there that you could just scan. So you could just do that on your phone, and then you have access. Uh, any other questions or? All right, I guess we can wrap up early. Um, if you do want to try the tutorial, uh, I could just leave those things there. You could take one of the pieces of paper with you. I'll probably spin down the environment like tomorrow or something. So if you feel like trying it out, um, you know, the link to the whole tutorial is in the resources. Um, yeah, just grab a slip of paper and you can try it out. And uh, beyond that, just let me know if you have any questions. Um, it's alex at netmaker.io. Um, so any questions about WireGuard or NetMaker or just doing fun stuff, um, yeah, feel free to let me know. Thank you. Thanks, guys.